So this morning we have Michaela Kiffer, is it pronounced Kiffer? Kiffer, yeah. Kiffer. I'm here to tell us about companion gardening, and I'm really anxious to learn more. I'm trying to follow a lot of the rules and advice given to us in these programs. Um, Michaela has experience, uh, you have a degree in biology and environmental studies, is that what I understand, and um, have yep. worked a lot with agriculture at college in mm -hmm. Maine and then um, in community gardens. Yep. And yep. also you were in the Peace Corps in Senegal. Which That's is really right. Exciting. Yeah. And it, I understand with urban gardens, meaning in the cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was working in urban agriculture. I see. So um, we're very lucky to have you here to teach us something about companion gardening. Sure. It's a great subject. So I'm excited to, I always love talking about companion planting just because there's um, sort of so much potential there. But um, yeah, I'll start screen sharing and start the presentation. See. Can you see that okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about companion planting today. Um, I've already gotten such a lovely introduction, I don't really think I need to introduce myself too much more, but um, just sort of the gist of it, I'm from Door County, went to college in Maine where I discovered my love of agriculture actually, um, and I've studied agriculture in Costa Rica. Um, in, I've studied agriculture in New York City. That was more sort of hydroponics and more like high-tech urban agriculture. Um, and then I worked in Senegal for six months in urban agriculture before, um, due to coronavirus, I'm back in Door County now, working at, um, working at a farm, doing some beekeeping and um, helping with the seed library as well. Um, Sorry, there we go. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about today is companion planting. So of course we have to define it first. Um, then we'll look at uh, some reasons why we should companion plant before uh, getting a little bit into the meat of it, looking at different types of benefits that companion planting can offer. Um, and then just sort of some tips for getting started in your own garden. So this is a bit of a formal definition of companion planting. Um, companion planting is the planting of a number of different crops in proximity for any of a number of different reasons, including pest control, pollination, providing habitat for beneficial insects, maximizing use of space, and to otherwise increase crop productivity. Um, so as you can see already, companion planting touches on a number of different aspects of gardening. Um, whether that's saving space, uh, interacting with pests and pollination. And um, yes, those are kind of the main ones. There's a few more nebulous ones that we'll get into later. Um, but I like this definition as well. Companion planting is the cultivation of plants that grow harmoniously together. It's an excellent way to conserve space and water and fully utilize a garden's available space. Um, and I think this, definition really gets at the idea of um, companion planting deals with intentionality a lot. Um, you're thinking a lot about like, what are the characteristics of a carrot, which might make it good to plant near an onion or better to plant near a tomato. Um, and you're thinking about all of the different factors and reasons why you uh, might plant in proximity with each other. Um, so if you've heard of companion planting before, uh, the three sisters method is one of the most famous examples of companion planting. Um, it originated in Mesoamerica thousands of years ago and um, was spread to North America and adapted in North America by indigenous groups here. Um, so in the three sisters method, um, you are growing corn, squash, and beans in proximity with each other. The corn stalks act as a sort of living trellis for the beans to climb up. Um, the squash shade the ground, um, which prevents a lot of weeds from growing up. And it also uh, sort of deters raccoons from getting into the corn too much. And then the beans, um, are, which are nitrogen fixers, will put nutrients into the soil. Um, that the corn and the squash can use as well. So 
this already is getting at you have um, sort of structural benefits, you know, the tall form and the, um, the spread of the squash leaves. And then you also have, you know, chemical benefits in terms of the soil nutrients, um, as well as kind of pest control in terms of the deterring raccoons aspects. Um, so this is, like I said, one of the most sort of quintessential examples of companion planting. Um, companion planting can also be very simple, um, just such as just planting tomato and basil near each other, um, which is uh, a lot of people will plant a row of tomatoes and then they'll put basil sort of in and among those tomatoes. And I wasn't able to find um, any sort of studies that back this up, but I know many, many gardeners that swear that planting tomato and basil near each other improves the flavor of both of them. Um, but they also, basil has some sort of uh, pest prevention effects for the tomato, um, and we'll get into that a little more later. Um, and then sort of, maybe I would say the purest realization of companion planting is the idea of a forest garden, which um, the idea behind a forest garden is to not only sort of mimic aspects of a natural ecosystem, but essentially to create an ecosystem, uh, a garden ecosystem, which uh, sustain it, can sustain itself as much as possible. Um, and the idea is that over time, the gardener themselves has to do less and less, um, and the system will sort of perpetuate itself. Um, and I really like this illustration of a forest garden because it gets it kind of the seven different levels um, that are present in the forest garden. So you have your tall trees, your lower trees, your climbing vines, your shrubs, your herbs, your ground cover plants, and your root plants. And this just gets it all of the different types of space that are used within a garden. Um, and again, we'll get into this a little more later. So um, I do want to take a moment to highlight that techniques like the Three Sisters technique that we just went over are many thousands of years old, and they were really prevalent in uh, Mesoamerica, Africa, and Asia. Um, they were sort of the pioneers of polyculture, which is, um, just to define polyculture real quick, it's in opposition to monoculture. So monoculture, we see a lot of it around here with these you know, big, expansive fields of corn, um, whereas polyculture is planting many different kinds of plants within your, your garden or your farm. Um, so polyculture was, you know, pioneered in these different areas. Um, and sort of after the Green Revolution, when monoculture became the prominent form of agriculture in the Western world, movements like uh, permaculture and the organic gardening movement became alternatives um, to this more technological form of agriculture. And unfortunately, these movements didn't credit the indigenous origins um, from which they got many of their techniques. So um, I think it's important for us, I highlighted this a little bit last time, but uh, in my previous talk, but to talk about it as well now that um, companion planting really has its roots in indigenous agriculture and has been co-opted to some extent by permaculture movements. Um, so I think it's important for us to recognize that so that we can give uh, proper credit. And this illustrate or this image here is an illustration of the Chinampa system, which is prevalent um, in Mesoamerica. And I believe this picture is particular to Mexico. Um, it's a very cool kind of like floating island system of agriculture practiced by the Aztecs. Um, and they were using campaign planting. What, what are they growing well. there? What are they growing? It really looks like they're growing some sort of lily. So I don't know if that's an agricultural crop per se, but I think it, I just thought it was kind of a good illustration of um, sort of the concept behind all of it. Yeah. So why should we companion plant? Um, companion planting allows us to make the most of our garden space. Um, this is obviously especially important in kind of urban settings where space is limited and maybe less so in Door County, you know, depending on the size of your lawn or your land. Um, 
but still, I mean, it always makes sense to uh, use less space and use it a bit more intensively and kind of pack things together like you can see in here just to conserve your space and you can conserve water a little bit that way as well. Um, companion planting also offers solutions for natural pest control um, and companion planting is a form of kind of ecologically minded gardening so it allows us to use ecosystem solutions to address you know any issues that we see in our gardens um, and generally it increases the biodiversity and the resilience that we see in our gardens. So we've, I've broken these benefits into three different types. So we're gonna be talking about insects, uh, both pests and pollinators. We'll be talking about structural benefits and we'll talk about chemical benefits as well. So the uh, insect benefits fall into kind of four main sections as well. Um, using companion planting, you can attract beneficial insects, you can attract pollinators, you can obscure crop cues, um, which is sort of a vague phrase, but I'll get into that more. And then uh, you can use companion plants as trap crops as well. So uh, companion plants, one of their most sort of common uses is planting um, oftentimes flowers, but it could be um, sort of crops that you might harvest as well. Um, nearby to your crops in order to lure in beneficial insects and these beneficial insects um, will typically prey on common garden pests like aphids or um, rips for instance so um, marigold for instance plus dill coriander queen ants lace and a few others will attract hoverflies and the larva of hoverflies will prey on aphids. Um, ladybugs are attracted by cosmos, goldenrod, marigold, and others, and they'll also prey on aphids. So the idea is that if you're filling your garden with lots of plants that are attractive to uh, these beneficial insects, you can help kind of introduce some natural pest control. Um, like I said, it's, you know, really most pests under the sun are going to have something that preys on them. So it's really just a matter of, you know, identifying what your pest problems are, um, identifying certain plants that are going to attract the natural predators of those pests to your garden, and then kind of letting nature do its thing. Um, another really important aspect of companion planting is attracting pollinators, which really not only benefit your personal garden's health, but they also benefit um, sort of the ecosystem more broadly to have a nice healthy population of native pollinators. Um, I mentioned in my previous presentation that three fourths of the world's flowering plants and about 35% of the world's food crops depend on animal pollinators to reproduce. So pollinators are really essential to the functioning of any healthy garden. And you wanna make sure you're sort of luring them in as well with some um, you know, typically flowers, of course, but um, you can do research if you want to attract specific pollinators to your garden or sort of just plant a, an array to attract an array of pollinators to your garden. Um, so this aspect of companion planting is really an exciting one, I think. Um, obscuring crop cues is such a opaque term, and I'm sorry I couldn't really figure out a way to make it um, accurate and more clear, but um, essentially what companion plants can do um, is it can help deter insect pests which rely on scent or sight to find their host plants. So um, the metaphor that you could use is if you're really into candy and someone hands you an enormous bag full of rocks and leaves and sticks, and rotten fruit and marbles and candy is going to be less appealing to you than someone handing you an enormous bag full of just candy. Um, so this is one of kind of the basic benefits of polyculture um, and companion planting can help you increase your crop diversity um, which will help kind of deter this like singular focus on one particular 
uh, host plant, you know, the candy, so to speak, for the insects. Um, some plants also have shown to be particularly good at either masking appealing smells or actually emitting unappealing smells, which will deter insect pests as well. Um, so just to kind of recap all of that, um, planting a lot of different kinds of crops in your garden is going to generally make it more confusing for insect pests, whether that's by just increasing um, visually the sort of the noise of your garden or um, via scent increasing just a lot of additional stimuli which make it hard for insects to home in on the particular plant that they're looking for. Um, and they can also have certain companion plants like the marigold can also have a repellent scent which will deter insects as well. Um, yeah. Is there anything else besides marigolds that's really good at that sort of thing? There are, yes, there's so no. many. Most of them are flowers. Um, so you're going to see, so really, I guess, the in terms of obscuring sight cues for insects, um, really any plant is going to do, they've even done studies where they'll put like little plastic plants kind of around in there. And it's really just like increasing the, um, the visual noise that an insect encounters and it makes it more difficult to home in on its particular plant. Um, but when it comes to sort of the, the scent aspect of it, there are definitely some that are better than others. Marigold is like the gold of companion planting. Um, but there's also, I mean, you have cosmos, nasturtium, uh, tansy, yarrow, um, mint I've heard is a good one as well. So there's really, there's a, there's a ton of them. Um, so you can really sort of pick your poison in terms of, you know, what kind of flowers do you like? And they're also related to, you know, maybe which sorts of pests do they deter in particular? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Companion plants can also function as trap crops. So this is another way of deterring pests. And essentially, um, just like us, insects have certain foods that they prefer. So, uh, for instance, nasturtium is going to be more appealing to aphids and flea beetles than, uh, you know, maybe some other crop like tomatoes or something. Um, <laughs> but so if you essentially if you plant nasturtium near your other crop, the flea beetles and the aphids are going to be drawn to the nasturtium and they're going to steer clear of whatever other crop you're trying to protect. Um, and that's sort of the concept of the trap crop. So you're trying to trap the pests within whichever crop they prefer most. Um, Blue Hubbard squash is a trap crop that works really well. It's like highly preferred by uh, cucumber beetles and squash bugs to a lot of other forms of squash and cucumbers. Um, you know, certain types of radishes can help. Um, they'll draw nematodes to them and then you can pull them out of the soil and get rid of the nematodes. Um, what is a nematode? A nematode, it's like a little, it's a, it's a root pest um, and it's like a little worm, but a very, very small little worm. Um, I honestly, I've heard of them so much elsewhere, but I haven't experienced them too much in Door County, so I'm not even sure that they're around here too much, but I, I could be wrong on that. Um, mm -hmm. But an anyway, so you can use either a trap crop that you're uh, planning to harvest um, or a trap crop that you're not. So maybe if you plant Blue Hubbard squash, um, you might still harvest that and consume it, you know, if it's not too damaged. But, you know, nasturtium is edible, but a lot of people don't really use it as a food crop. Um, you know, nasturtium can take a lot of damage and you just don't have to worry about harvesting it at all. So um, that's kind of the theory behind trap crops. Um, is a pretty clever one, in my opinion. And sort of all of the techniques that I've just described, the trap crops, the, um, the pollination, the pest, sort of the natural predators and beneficial insects. Um, that's all really like 
plant by plant and pest by pest. So um, you sort of have to do focus like inquiry in order to get something that's useful. Um, or, you know, you can kind of just do scattershot if you want for some of it. If you just like the theory of companion planting, you know, just plant a bunch of flowers and it'll have some of these effects and you won't know exactly which ones, but if you're not worried about it, you don't need to worry about it. So it's good. Um, great. So companion plants, uh, as I mentioned, they also offer structural benefits. They um, can act as living trellises. They can perform some weed suppression effects. So they can also provide shade for other plants. And we'll get into each of these. Um, so this is the three sisters method again. Um, in this, the corn is acting as the living trellis for the beans to climb up um, and use as a stalk. Um, sunflowers can also work well for this, as well as amaranth or sunchokes. And you just want to make sure that whatever your um, trellis, sorry, uh, whatever your trellis is and whatever you're planning to trellis up that, um, that the weight, you know, isn't too detrimental. So, for instance, um, you know, cucumbers are a plant that you trellis, but they can get pretty heavy. So you want to make sure you're using a living trellis that can uh, sustain the weight of whatever crop is going to be climbing up it. Um, weed suppression is also a great benefit of companion planting. And this is generally, I mean, companion planting sort of encourages uh, increasing the density of what you plant in your garden. Um, so this is kind of just a natural effect, but if you want to um, intensify it a little bit, you can look at their sort of specific combinations here. Um, arugula is being used to shade out weeds for onions and, um, you know, so obviously the onions are mostly just growing in the ground. They have their stalks, but then you have all this kind of bare soil that you could use for a plant like arugula. Um, which not only is a great way of kind of making the most of your space, but it also, the broad leaves will shade out the soil a little bit. So you won't have as many weed problems. And, um, you know, supposedly onions act as a trap crop for flea beetles for arugula. Seems like this arugula still got a little bit of damage in here, but, um, you know, the theory behind it is, I think this is a good example be, um, that covers how you can use how one effect, the weed suppression, can also be related to another effect, which is the, the trap crop effect. So. And this goes along with the chemical free gardening that you talked about last time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, companion planting and chemical free gardening are so um, closely related and interrelated. Um, so I think it's really cool how these techniques kind of feed into each other, which is great. Um, Another effect that companion planting can have is providing shade for plants that may need it a little more. Um, so for instance, you can grow whole beans um, on the sunny side of lettuce to give that lettuce a little bit of shade. Um, but this really works for any sort of tall leafy plant in, co in combination with any plant that's prone to overheating. Lettuce is an easy example, but um, you know, if you, if you notice that you're I feel like my cilantro always overheats. So um, if you notice that a plant is uh, bolting really early in the season or if it's overheating, um, next season you can consider giving it a little shade barrier in the form of another plant as well. Um, and then just to return, I wanted to return to the forest garden for a minute because the forest garden is really all about structural benefits. Um, as you can see, here there's, you know, talked about the seven different layers and you can really, um, those layers are, can overlap with each other. So when you're thinking about companion planting for structural benefits, you want to be thinking about both the above ground um, space and the below ground space that crops are occupying and how they're going to be accessing sun and water and nutrients. And we'll get into the nutrients elements a little more in, the minute, in a minute. Um, but, you know, think about, you may not want to plant, um, a bushy plant next to a bushy plant, um, but you might want to plant a root crop under a bushy plant. So 
that's sort of, you can kind of jigsaw mix and match together. Um, but that's kind of what the forest garden is all about. So uh, we're going to look at chemical benefits a little bit, um, which kind of take three different forms in terms of a flavor boost, um, in terms of nitrogen fixation and sort of generally soil fil uh, fertility considerations, and then also in terms of uh, avoiding growth inhibitors. That's less of a benefit, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get there. So as I mentioned before, um, there are certain crops which are said to increase uh, or sort of uh, enhance the flavor of other crops that grow near them. And I think this is going to be fairly subjective, something that you're going to be, you know, maybe you really like how, you know, um, like Geneva basil or Genovese basil tastes when it's put next to tomatoes, but not Thai basil or something like that. Um, there's not a ton of research that really backs this one up, but I just want to kind of put that consideration out there and something to think about. And you can, and you'll sort of see this in the companion planting literature. So to be taken with a grain of salt or not. Um, let's see, nitrogen fixers are really excellent companion plants. Generally, you would want to plant um, a nitrogen fixing plant next to a plant that uh, is called like a heavy feeder. So for instance, like tomatoes are heavy feeders, corn is a heavy feeder. Um, it's any plant that's going to be drawing a lot of nutrients from the soil. And so if you uh, plant a legume, like a bean, you know, a bean plant or peas or clover, um, either near uh, corn, we get back to our three sisters planting method again, uh, or you can do it, I guess, sorry, to make it more clear, you can, you can companion plant Companion planting primarily refers to um, spatial proximity, but you can also, in this instance, think about it in terms of temporal proximity as well. So maybe where you grew your peas last year, you want to grow your corn this year so that corn can make the most of the nutrients that the peas left in the soil. Um, but just sort of considerations, again, in spatial and temporal proximity. And then you also, this is kind of an antagonistic effect. You'll see um, a little bit on this as well if you start looking into companion planting. But this is uh, the black walnut tree, which I'm sure many know um, is sort of emits a toxin into the soil, which repels other plants and makes it more difficult for those other plants to grow around them. Um, and it's not just black walnuts that do this, but really a number of any plants. Um, one that pops up a lot in companion planting literature is beans and onions don't do well together. Um, the onions emit sort of um, some sort of chemical which inhibits the growth of beans and peas. So whenever you're companion planting, you can kind of take this into consideration so that you don't put these things right next to each other by accident. So this is kind of more of a preventative um, method than something that's going to necessarily have a positive benefit. It's just uh, you want to make sure that you're keeping that in mind when you're you know, yeah, so, I, um, yeah, I had an invasive species in my yard. I think it was mustard garlic. Mm -hmm. And someone told me that that emits some sort of toxin. Oh, so yeah. Where could you, I, I guess I should look into that some more, but books on companion gardening might have more on that sort of subject? Yeah, I think that that, um, I'm not sure how much they would have about like garlic mustard or invasive species in general. I think it's more so thinking about, you want to avoid antagonistic effects in like plants that you're planting intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure if there's sort of something that could fight back against garlic mustard or, um, you know, what if there are plants that are maybe resistant to its toxins? Um, not too sure about that, but interesting to look into for sure. Um, so we're going to talk about getting started now. So 
those are, I gave sort of the broad overarching theory and some of the more kind of specific examples of campaign you're planting. And um, now it's time to get started. Um, when you Google companion planting, this is what you will find. Um, don't get overwhelmed. It's all right. Um, it's really, companion planting is a really excellent tool. It's a really great resource. Um, you may find conflicting information out there. You may not. It may be difficult, um, you know, choosing which companions to use. Uh, as you can see, um, well, maybe as you can see, it's a little bit cluttered, but um, a lot of companion plants go well with so many other different kinds of plants that you end up with this really complicated web of what goes well with what and what doesn't and what should you use. It's easy to get overwhelmed. Um, so it's important to start small. Um, start by using your own observations in your garden. Um, and this is something you can do right now. So this is a good time to be having this talk because right now you can think about um, what pest problems am I having? What is growing really well? Um, what is not growing so well? What needs more sun? What needs more shade? Um, sort of just take mental or physical notes on different issues or strengths that might be present in your garden. And you can use that to sort of direct uh, your attention to what might be relevant for companion planting to use companion planting in your garden. So after you sort of um, have an idea, okay, I have a ton of cucumber beetles, um, what can I do about that? That's when you sort of uh, go into these charts and start to use your resources to figure out, okay, what are some solutions for cucumber beetles? Uh, you can plant nasturtium nearby to act as a deterrent or a trap crop. Uh, you can plant radishes nearby that act as a deterrent. And, um, you know, you can really identify these specific solutions and then that'll sort of help you build your garden and plant your garden for next year. Um, the way I sort of approach this process is to think about what pest problems I've been having kind of as the major foundation. So, um, you know, if my tomatoes are really prone to pests, certain pests. I'll research what are good companion plants for tomatoes for addressing these pest problems. And then you just really pack a lot of those plants in there. Um, and, you know, you can use the, the charts to see what's going to, what's going to be good companions for those tomatoes. Um, and then, then I sort of go to the charts more broadly and say, you know, okay, um, you know, I don't think beans and cucumbers have any antagonistic effects and maybe I can grow them next to each other because they're both going to be using um, a trellis, you know, so you can kind of make use of your space like that. And you start to think about the structural elements of things as well, you know, what, which plants need more shade and, you know, where can I sort of tuck those away in there. So you start to kind of weave this picture um, that comes together more and more each year and each year you can kind of check and say, okay, what went well this year? What do I need to improve? And obviously this is what gardening is all about. Um, and it's okay to start small. Um, you can, as I've sort of been going into, one companion plant might have a really large variety of effects. So if you even commit to saying, okay, I'm just gonna plant you know, one type of companion plant this year, that's going to be affecting your garden. It's going to have sort of a ripple effect. And each year you can kind of build on that and keep thinking about, again, always checking in what's going well, what's not going so well, and what could I use as sort of, you know, a boost, a deterrent, something to enhance or protect a certain crop that maybe I care about or maybe this um, other crop. So. And it's just important to note as well that your garden is its own microcosm. So it's going to be different every year and it's going to be different from your neighbor's garden and that's okay. Um, so, you know, just start with what you know and there's a lot of really um, vast information out there that you can tap into and just you can build slowly from there. Um, so just to review a little bit of what we've talked about today. 
um, companion planting can help with a variety of different things, including cease, pests, resilience, and plant vigor. Um, one single companion plant can have a whole suite of benefits, and each crop, companion plant, and pest will have specific recommendations. Um, I included all of those charts a few slides ago before we're going to be moving into the Q&A because I don't have all those charts memorized. So, you know, I know some companion plant combinations off of the top of my head, but it's truly a vast, um, the way that you can piece everything together. And then, um, you know, it's important to start with what you know, ask sort of directed questions and start to build um, sort of the diversity and the resilience of your garden slowly over time. So just some image credits. And Do you have any books you. or magazines that you would recommend that you use? Um, I tend to use online resources a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I know Mother Earth News has a lot of um, information on companion planting. Um, there's a few books that I've come across and I can't remember their titles off the top of my head. They're all pretty kind of like straightforward, like companion planting or, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. I think we have enough of a thing. in the library. But yeah. Uh, yeah, Mother Earth News is a good journal. Yeah, yeah. And I do, I do also, um, a lot of extension offices have really great resources on companion planting mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I usually try to, I feel like there's certain kind of myths that can circulate year after year um, that maybe they're myths, maybe they're not, I don't really know, but sometimes if you want to, if you want an example that's kind of tried and true, um, you can, you know, rely on the hearsay or you can sort of go to a more research-based um, solution and that would be an extension services. A lot of them will just have like, you know, a page about companion planting or something. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I have a personal question. Um, I planted some squash. I thought it was zucchini. I had one thing grow and everyone else seems to have tons of zucchini grow. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, I have a lot of pollinator plants nearby, some prairie plants that mm -hmm. um, I thought would attract pollinators, but what am I doing wrong? Or what, what is a companion <laughs> plant for zucchini? <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I didn't it's hard to say for sure. Um, my, my personal zucchini is not having the best season either, but, um, and generally they tend to be so vigorous, so it's always a little disappointing yeah. when zucchini go awry, but um, I did some research a couple of years ago actually uh, particular to zucchini and I found that um, you can plant radishes and nasturtium nearby and that was that was really helpful for me for um, for pest deterring effects in terms of it seems like you you're not having a lot of major pest problems um, so you know it could be a soil thing I'm not really yeah. sure exactly what it could be but um, you know, I don't know, maybe something, maybe switch around the location to where it might have a little more nitrogen next year or something like that, but. Yeah, I'll have to, I should test the soil. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly how to go about that, but I've heard that's the first thing we should do. So, I'll have yeah. to. Yeah, <laughs> can't hurt. <laughs> well, I was wondering, I wonder if anyone in the um, room here has any questions. I think they're muted, but if we could unmute them. Does anyone have anything to ask? <laughs> well, if not, um, thank you very much for, for telling us something about this. I'm definitely going to go out and evaluate what I have in my yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, you know, that zucchini gets me. I just don't understand that. when. People bring in zucchini to work and put it out for everyone to share, and I don't have anything on my plants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it can be definitely else. disappointing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I appreciate you coming in and telling us about this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. <laughs>